Dive into God's Word. Dig a little deeper. Discover the Bible's message for you today. Pathway to Paradise Ministries presents Deeper, your daily Bible study with Dr. Tim Rumsey and Pastor David Salazar. Thank you for joining us again as we finish up this week's set of lessons on Daniel chapter 8. The title of our lesson today is The Time of the End and the Year 1844. Uh, Before we dive into that particular topic, I wanted to just uh, finish a thought that I ran out of time on yesterday. We were reading a statement from the book Great Controversy in which it is stated that, quote, the intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. By his death, he began that work which after his resurrection he ascended to complete in heaven, end quote. This idea is challenged sometimes, friends, uh, you know, and, and the, the challenge is usually, well, what else do we need beyond the cross? There is a verse which I think most of you probably know by heart in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that verse, 1 John 1, 9, reveals that there are two big parts to Christ's work for us. There is forgiveness of sins, and there is cleansing from all unrighteousness. And really, those two parts of the plan of salvation are connected with uh, the two aspects of his ministry. His death on the cross provides forgiveness for sins. It enables God to justly forgive us of our sins. It's a legal solution to the problems of sins in the past. But, you know, just Christ's death alone would accomplish nothing. We have a risen Savior. He is not still dead in the tomb. He is living and working for us today. And the sanctuary explains what Christ is doing for us today. What does it mean that we have an intercessor in heaven, a high priest in heaven? Uh, it means that he can help us practically today and that he can give us his righteousness and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we see that the sanctuary explains both of these parts of the plan of salvation that are referred to in 1 John 1, 9, forgiveness of sins and cleansing from all unrighteousness. Now, something of that magnitude um, should appear in Bible prophecy, and it does, in Daniel 8, verse 14, where we have the prophecy of the 2,300 uh, evenings and mornings, or days. We understand uh, through the day-for-a-year principle that that's actually 2,300 years, and uh, next week we'll study the, the time aspects of this, but we'll see that that prophecy ends in the year 1844. Uh, some people have Ask the question. Many people have asked the question. Okay, that's one prophecy in the Bible. Show me something to verify that that was an important year. Uh, and you know, the claim is that that year is just picked out of thin air, or it's an excuse for um, the big theological mistake, as some people would put it, that uh, Jesus did not come back on October twenty-two, eighteen forty-four. Well, today I want to share with you just a few of the many significant things that happened in the year 1844. Um, Before I do that, though, I need to have a word of prayer. So uh, let's uh, bow our heads. Father in heaven, uh, we thank you for prophecy. What a fascinating field of study it is. And as we finish up uh, our study today of Daniel chapter 8, we ask that you would guide and direct us as we look at some of the significant events or trends that started on earth in the year 1844. Uh, Lord, may we see their connection with what you're trying to do and how it reveals that we truly are close to the second coming. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to share with you, um, we'll see how much time we have. I have five things on my list here. And um, these are all events or trends that began right in or around the year 1844, and these are all uh, significant things that have really shaped our world today and um, in many ways have conditioned our world uh, here in the time of the end to be uh, ripe uh, for destruction, ripe for the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
the first one is this. Um, Frederick Ingalls and Karl Marx began forming working societies, which were the forerunners of the communist ideology. And their first workers' meetings were formed in the year 1844. Uh, I have a short quote from a letter written by Ingalls to Marx on October 19, 1844, just less than a month after the Great Disappointment. Uh, Here's what Ingalls wrote to Marx. We are at present holding public meetings all over the place to set up societies for the advancement of the workers. These meetings are arranged on the spur of the moment and without asking the police. We succeeded at two meetings in thoroughly trouncing the pious by a huge majority. Everything Christian was banned from the rules. Christianity, which according to their own assertions forms the basis of the society, must nowhere be mentioned in the rules. End quote. Pretty uh, shocking statement here as to the, uh, the ideology lying underneath these workers' unions, uh, or the workers' societies, which, uh, of course, the, the labor unions of today are also tied into this. And uh, you don't have time to trace all of the history here, but the, the communist atheistic ideology um, got a big boost by these workers' societies. And it's very clear from the letter here that the intent is to make these completely atheist, anti-Christian even. And very interesting that this really got its its way in the fall of 1844. Now, a few years later, in 1848, Karl Marx wrote the more popular uh, or the well-known book, The Communist Manifesto. Uh, here's another thing that took place in 1844. Uh, Max Stirner, a German philosopher, wrote a book titled The Ego and Its Own in which he helped lay the philosophical groundwork for many aspects of postmodern culture. Here's what one review of the book says, and this is uh, from the stanford.edu website. Uh, Quote, He provides a sweeping attack on the modern world as dominated by religious modes of thought and oppressive social institutions, together with a brief sketch of a radical egoistic alternative in which individual autonomy might flourish. Stirner's book can plausibly be claimed to have influenced the tradition of individualist anarchism. End quote. Now, there's a lot packed into that that, uh, short paragraph. Uh, So let's just take it piece by piece here. Uh, He provides a sweeping attack on the modern world as dominated by religious modes of thought. Okay, so here's an attack on religion in general. Um, and oppressive social institutions. Well, what would those oppressive social institutions be within this context? Probably churches, probably organized religion. Um, These are oppressive in Stirner's mindset. In place of that, and in place of of God, really, um, there is a new God that is put in place, and that is the God of self, the egoistic alternative in which individual autonomy might flourish. Have you ever heard that idea in today's world? Well, you can't tell me what to do. You can't tell me what to believe. Um, I'll decide for myself. Or, you know, your truth uh, is fine for you, but don't, don't try to tell me how to live my life. That's a very postmodern, uh, very active and alive mindset in our world today. Um, Stirner's book, written in 1844, was one of the significant influencers that uh, have helped develop this mindset uh, in our modern world. Okay, we're going to look at another example now uh, of something that took place right around 1844. In 1843, Margaret Fuller, a forerunner of the feminist movement and the sexual revolution that exploded in the 1960s, wrote a series of articles that broke many social norms of the times. In 1945, these articles were published in a book called Woman in the 19th Century. Here's what the Encyclopedia Britannica says of her book, quote, The book's unprecedented and frank discussions of marriage and relations between men and women scandalized many. That's from, uh, end quote, that's from Britannica.com. Now, 
uh, you can look look her up online. There's a website. I think it's margaretfuller.org, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, proponents of uh, today's uh, sexual liberation of of uh, feminism, of the uh, you know the homosexual movement, LGBT plus, all the letters that come after it, they're very open about looking back at Margaret Fuller as one of the forerunners of their movement. Uh, they're they're very embracive of her, of her writings, of the agenda that she had, which was uh, really groundbreaking in many ways in the early 1840s. Now, she wrote the articles in 1843. She was then asked to put them into a book, which was published in 1845, which means that in 1844, she was rewriting these articles into the form of a book. Very interesting. A couple more examples. Uh, In 1844, Robert Chambers, an English scientist, wrote a book titled Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation. This book provided a theological and philosophical stepping stone from creationism to evolution as the accepted view of origins. Now, Chambers is not as well remembered today, of course, as Charles Darwin was, Um. Charles Darwin wrote his book, Origin of the Species, in 1859. However, in the introduction to the book, here is uh, what Charles Darwin wrote, and I'm quoting now. After five years' work, I allowed myself to speculate on the subject and drew up some short notes. These I enlarged in 1844 into a sketch of the conclusions, which then seemed to me probable. Very interesting. Two significant books, one published by Robert Chambers in 1844, laying the groundwork for Charles Darwin's later book, um, which, uh, of course, is has been so significant and influential uh, on the uh, evolutionary worldview that so many people have today. And again, Charles Darwin's book was uh, enlarged in 1844 as he was working on his sketches. One final example uh, of significant events that took place in 1844. Perhaps you have heard of the Baha'i faith. It's influential in the United Nations. Uh, It got its start in 1844. Its founder, Sayyid Ali Muhammad, became known as the Bab after he announced that he was the bearer of a message destined to to transform the spiritual life of humanity. Uh, By the way, the Bab, of course, has a common root with Babel or Babel, and um, in, uh, in um, the original language, it can mean the gate to heaven or the gate to the gods. So, interesting name that he chose for himself. Now, according to an official Baha'i website, at the time of the appointed... Oh, okay, here's why they look at 1844 uh, as the time when their, their faith started here. And I'm quoting now uh, from... UHJ.net. That stands for United House of Justice. It's an official Baha'i website. Here's their explanation as to why the year 1844. Quote, At the time of the appointed hour in 1844, after the prescribed time allotted of the 2300 evenings and mornings or years had passed away, the Bob arose. End quote. Fascinating uh insight from even a non-Christian uh, perspective as to the um, significance of Daniel 8, verse 14. Now, of course, we don't look to outside sources for the validity of the Bible like that, but it is, it is interesting, isn't it, that all of these ha- things happened in the year 1844. Well, friends, we're out of time. I'm trying to talk too quickly because the clock is uh, winding down on me. Thanks for joining us today and this week in our study of Daniel chapter 8, and I hope that uh, you'll join us again tomorrow. Deeper is a production of Pathway to Paradise Ministries. For more Bible study resources, including books, DVDs, and study guides, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. To support this ministry with your tax-deductible contribution, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. That's 855-447-8788.